Good evening and welcome to the second lecture in the Diverse Roots at the Common Table lecture series, a series focused on culinary conversations in the American South. My name is Erica Abrams Locklear and I'm a professor in the English department here at UNC Asheville and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. I've got a few things to share with you before I introduce tonight's speaker. First, please silence all electronic devices. I'll give you a minute to do that. And next, if you'd like to attend more lectures like this one about Southern food, keep an eye out for announcements about future speakers. The Diverse Roots at the Common Table series runs through the spring semester of 2025 and we are planning to have a speaker or panel of speakers each semester. This fall, for example, we will welcome Kentucky Poet Laureate and founding member of the Afrolachian Poets, Crystal Wilkinson, to campus. She will speak to us about her forthcoming food memoir, Praise Songs for the Kitchen Ghosts, and the role that food plays in her creative work. Her talk is scheduled for October 18th at 6 p.m., so mark your calendars. Second, tonight's lecture will last about 45 minutes, followed by approximately 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So I have two brief sets of directions for our different audiences depending on your attendance mode. If you're joining us tonight via Zoom, and I'm thrilled so many of you are out there in Zoom land, last time I checked there were 144 people that was a book, it's okay, uh, registered on Zoom. So once we get started, you'll be able to see Mr. Miller's face here where it says Adrian Miller instead of my face. And you'll see the slides as he progresses through them. I uh, also wanted you to know that we're recording this lecture both on Zoom and via video. If you're on Zoom, you're welcome to use the chat feature on the toolbar along the bottom of your Zoom window to make comments or to chat with one another, but I won't be monitoring the chat. Conversely, if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A session, please use the Q&A feature, which is right beside the chat button, uh, and I will be monitoring that. And that button's also on your toolbar. For our in-person audience, we have a microphone mounted on a stand right there. It's kind of in the middle of the room. It's a blue microphone. So please come up to the microphone to ask your question. We are video recording the event and we get much better sound if the mic is stationary. For both audiences, since we have limited time for discussion, please refrain from making comments or observations because we want to hear as many questions as possible. So once we conclude discussion, please remain in your seats until Mr. Miller has had time to exit the room and get situated at the Malaprops table just outside these doors in the back. If you would like to purchase one of, or all of, Mr. Miller's books and or have him sign them, Malaprops has a table set up just outside the doors and to the left. And for our Zoom audience, please remember that you can also order these books from Malaprops website. Many people have worked hard to make this event a success and I'd like to thank them briefly now. A big thank you to our event partner, Malaprops Bookstore and Cafe. Asheville's own local independent bookstore. They have advertised this event widely. Yeah, let's clap for them. That was good. Um, they have advertised this event widely and are here tonight selling books. Thank you to Stephanie Jones Beern, Justin Souther, Patricia Furnish, and the rest of the Malaprops crew. Heartfelt thanks go to Asheville Citizen Times food reporter Tiana Cannell who wrote a beautiful article about tonight's lecture that I know is the reason some of you are here because I asked you that made the front page of the paper. Equal thanks go to Gina Malone, editor at the Laurel of Asheville Magazine and assistant editor Natasha Anderson for their fantastic story on tonight's event. The Marketing and Communications Department here at UNC Asheville, Mountain Express, Carlton Smith, UNC Asheville's Director of Multicultural Affairs, Catherine Frank at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, Chris Asbill and Kent Thompson on the tech side of things, and our workers who are here tonight as well, Scott and Gail, also des deserve, excuse me, a big thanks for their help with event planning and promotion. 
Funding for this event is made possible thanks to the Thomas Howerton Distinguished Professor of Humanities Professorship in the English Department. And finally, my biggest thanks goes to Adrian Miller, who said yes when I invited him to be part of this series. <laughs> so clap for that too. <laughs> And if you're here, then you already know something about Adrian Miller's impressive record. He is a culinary historian, food writer, and author of three books, Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time, The President's Kitchen Cabinet, The Story of the African Americans Who Have Fed Our First Families from the Washingtons to the Obamas, and Black Smoke, African Americans in the United States of Barbecue. Tonight's lecture, Southern Black Chefs in the White House, is drawn from the President's Kitchen Cabinet. His books have twice won a James Beard Award for reference and scholarship, and he was recently featured in High on the Hog, How African American Cuisine Transformed America, a Netflix documentary based on Jessica Harris's book by the same name. He also served as a special assistant to the president under the Clinton administration and served as the deputy director of the president's initiative for One America. We are extremely fortunate to have him here with us tonight. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Adrian Miller to UNC Asheville. Good evening, everyone. It is so good to be here and talk about Southern chefs. So um, what I'm going to do is give you a sense of my journey, because I know that when people find out that I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, it immediately loses me all street cred on subjects about black food. But this is how I win people back. My parents are from the South. My mom is from Chattanooga, Tennessee. My dad is from Helena, Arkansas. Great migration story. They independently came to Denver from their parts of the South, met there, and then um, you know, decided to stay. So even though in an unlikely place like the suburbs of Denver, I was steeped in black culture, and I'm so grateful that, that my parents did that um, because they raised me on soul food, barbecue, and kept me connected to a black church. And they easily could have you know, said, we're in a different context now, we're not gonna do that, but they did that. So I'm immensely grateful. So, uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about my journey, how I came to write these books, and then we'll go through uh, a kind of a, really like an overview of my books, and I'll tell you just stories that I think you'll find entertaining, and then I look forward to your questions. So thank you, UNC Asheville and the Asheville community for supporting me tonight. So um, this is a picture of the White House kitchen. Has anybody here ever been to the, on a White House tour where they saw the kitchen? Okay, for those, yes, right here. Tell us, what, was, what surprised you most about the White House kitchen? Unfortunately, we never saw the kitchen. Oh, you did it. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Did, okay, you saw the kitchen. Tell me what was surprised you most about the kitchen. It is so small. The White House kitchen in the basement is only 26 by 32 feet. So that's it. Uh, and so when they do the big state dinners and things like that, they actually have to do cooking outside and set up stations and all that kind of stuff because there's just very limited space. So um, this gentleman is named Adam Colick. He is a White House kitchen steward, so his job is really to make sure that the uh, equipment in the White House is working well, um, but he also helps out with the cooking. He's an impressive guy. He's an amateur bodybuilder, so just an impressive guy. He has been there since the Reagan administration, and he's there to this day. Really, the only people that get nervous with the change of administration is the head cook. Those are the ones who usually get fired, all right? All right, so I'm the Soul Food Scholar. My tagline is dropping knowledge like hot biscuits, which I'm going to do tonight. Yes, biscuits. I was thinking about Snoop Dogg, you know, drop it like it's hot. And yeah, OK. You are highly encouraged to do social media tonight. I'm Soul Food Scholar on most platforms. So if you enjoy this presentation, please give a brother some love. Unless you have something negative to say, if you're a hater, then just hold on to that. There's really no reason to post. So my journey, so uh, born and raised in Denver, then I went to Stanford undergrad, then I went to Georgetown Law School, uh, came back to Denver and I practiced law for about four years and I hated it. So this is not to disparage anybody who's an attorney, you have attorneys in your family or in your f circle of friends, it just wasn't for me. It got to the point where I was singing spirituals in my office <laughs> and uh, you know it was bad because white people were joining in. I'd go to the copy machine and say, hey, Becky, how's it going? She would just look at me and say, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I was like, damn. 
dang. So I was gonna open up a soul food restaurant. I had a chef, I had a building, I was raising money. And then um, a friend from Georgetown Law School called me up, I'm in Denver now. And she said, hey, I've got this job in the Clinton administration. We're looking for somebody to fill a spot. Do you have any friends back in DC who might want to do this job? And I said, well, tell me more about the job. So she was working on something called the President's Initiative for One America. Now, the President's Initiative for One America was built on the initiative on race. And here's the wild and crazy idea with the initiative on race. If we just talked to one another and listened, we might realize that we have a lot more in common than would supposedly divide us. Crazy, right? Yeah, yeah I know, shocking. So. Um, after my friend told me about this and she wanted me to recruit others, I did the same thing that Dick Cheney did when George W. Bush asked him to find a vice president. I was the head of the search committee. My name was the only one on the list. So I went and really enjoyed my time in the White House. I only had one quibble. Um, first of all, if you're familiar with the White House complex, my office was when what was called the old executive office building. It's now the Eisenhower executive office building. So I was part of the White House compound. My only quibble is just the times that I've met um, President Clinton. Has anybody here actually met President Clinton? Okay, would you share your, in the blue shirt here, would you tell us about that experience? Uh, yeah, two things. Uh, he's really tall. Mm -hmm. Six uh, four. He has an amazing ability. When he talks to people, it just locks everybody. We see that in lines all the time. It's like they're the only two people there. Perfect. You cued that up perfectly. <laughs> I worked for President Clinton for about a year and a half. I never got that. Every time I talked to him, it was like the first time I'd say, Mr. President, I get a blank look, kind of like the one you're giving me right now. I'd say, I'm Adrian Miller, blank look. And I'd say, I work on your One America Initiative. Then he would say something like, that's great. And then we would talk about whatever. <laughs> so at that point in my life, I wanted to be the senator from Colorado. So I was trying to get back to Colorado, start my um, political career, but the job market was slow because the internet bubble had burst. And I was just in DC a lot longer than I thought. And so I was watching a lot of daytime television. I'm not even gonna tell you what shows. Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> and in the depth of my depravity, I said, I should read something. So I went to a local bookstore and I found this book on the history of Southern food written by a guy named John Edgerton called Southern Food at Home, On the Road in History. John Edgerton, great guy. This is a seminal work on Southern food studies. If you're interested in Southern food history, you really need to get this book. And I'm reading the book and then, um, he writes that the tribute to American uh, black achievement and American cookery has yet to be written. The, he wrote that in the late 80s. I'm reading the book in 2001. I thought that was really interesting. So I tracked him down on the internet and I wrote him and I said, Mr. Edgerton, you wrote this um, in your book. Do you still think this is true? And he said, you know, for the most part, nobody's taken on the full story. There's always room for another voice. So with no qualifications at all, except for eating a lot of soul food and cooking it some, that's what started the journey. So um, I got back to Colorado, I, wasn't, I get a, did get a political job, and then I was like an amateur grad student. So on the evenings and on weekends, I went to my local library. I'm blessed to have a wonderful library in Denver, and I just grabbed everything I could on African American food. Um, and through that, uh, just all of that research, that led to my first book, Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine. So the research that I did is I read 3,500 oral histories of formerly enslaved people. I've just traced every reference to food. I outlined that. I read about 500 cookbooks because I wanted to just put African-American food traditions in a larger culinary context. Half of those books were authored by African-Americans. I read thousands of newspaper and magazine articles because these are digitized now and word searchable. Talked to hundreds of people. And then because I care about my research so deeply, I decided to eat my way through the country. <laughs> so I went to 150 soul food restaurants in 35 cities in 15 states. I know, you're surprised I'm still alive. Yeah, I am too, um, but I really enjoyed it. And um, that's the research that led to soul food. So the way that I organized the soul food book is I created a representative soul food meal. I wrote a chapter about every part of the meal and I explained what it is, how it got on the soul food plate, and what it means for the culture. And then most chapters have recipes, traditional, health conscious, and then fancy ones in case you want to show off as a cook. So I'm going to very quickly go through this meal. Now I'm part of the black faith tradition, so we're used to call and response. So I'm gonna go through the, yes, that's right, you're off to a good start. So I'm gonna go through it, I'm gonna list the item, you can say amen, snap your fingers, preach that brother, whatever, all right? So entrees, fried chicken, yeah. catfish, yeah. chitlins. <laughs> for, the, for the uninitiated, chitlins are pig intestines, usually stewed or fried. 
Uh, then I went to the side dishes, so I wrote about greens. Soul food greens are collard, kale, mustard, turnip, cabbage. Those are the most popular ones. So I tell audience outside the South, if you've been introduced to kale in the last five to 10 years, welcome to the party, because we've been eating it for about 300. <laughs> Black eyed peas, candy jams, and then I also wrote a chapter about mac and cheese. I wasn't going to, because I thought mac and cheese was too universal, right? There wasn't a soul food angle, but so many of my black friends threatened to slap me upside my head <laughs> that I succumbed to peer pressure and included that. Then I wrote a chapter about cornbread, chapter about hot sauce, and I wrote a chapter about red drink, red Kool-Aid, because I believe red Kool-Aid is the official soul food drink. <laughs> now, there is, you have to understand in soul food culture, red is a color and a flavor. So African-Americans, we don't call things cherry or strawberry or that it has hints of cranberry, it's just red. There is a generational shift happening. There's a lot of youngins that like purple and blue. And as I wrote in my book, I do believe the children are our future, that we should teach them well and let them lead the way, but not on Kool-Aid because they're messing it up. <laughs> and then for dessert, pound cake, banana pudding, peach cobbler, sweet potato pie. So that book won the James Beard Award. I was really blessed for that. Um, and then while I was writing the Soul Food book, I came across a few stories of African-Americans who had cooked for our presidents. Only a few stories, so I thought, well, let me dig a little deeper and see what I can find and build on that. And then through that research, I identified 150 African-Americans who have cooked for our presidents. And I know that I'm just scratching the surface because the, these cooks were not well documented. And so we'll get deeper into their story. Um, I was nominated for a Colorado Book Award for History and also the NAACP Award for uh, Image Award for literary, uh, Best Literary Nonfiction. So very happy about that. Now, I knew that, I, so I went to Hollywood to you know, be part of the award ceremony. Now, I knew I was not gonna win because Dick Gregory, who had died a few months earlier, was in the same category. So I knew I wasn't gonna win anything, but I did get closer to a lifelong goal. I always wanted to meet the actress Halle Berry, and she was one of the presenters that year. So here's the progress that I made, y'all. We were in the same building at the same time. <laughs> I gotta tell you though, if you go back and look at uh, that ceremony, the recording of that ceremony, when she's presenting, she does stumble over her words. That's the exact moment when our eyes met. <laughs> Even though I was way up in the balcony, so. And then my latest book is Black Smoke, uh, African Americans, United States of Barbecue. The reason why I wrote this book is because if you look at storytelling about barbecue, African Americans have either been pushed to the margins or left out of the story completely. And for you on the South, you know that that is crazy. And one of the catalysts for writing that book is in 2004, I was watching the Food Network, and there was a commercial for Paula Deen's Southern Barbecue. So I thought, well, let me just watch this book. I knew I was going to write something on barbecue eventually, because I was going to include it in the Soul Food book, but I found so much, I thought it needs its own uh, treatment. And so I thought, well, let me just watch this show and just see um, you know, who she highlights, what the current trends are. 60 minutes later, as the credits are rolling, not one African American was featured on that show. So I thought, well, how does this even happen, 2004? And the second thing I thought is, well, maybe I got it twisted. Maybe it was Paula Deen's Scandinavian barbecue, <laughs> sponsored by Alabama White Sauce. So, you know, I just, I... so that's the journey. All right, so when we, come, when we talk about presidential food, I like to use this metaphor, the presidential pickle. And you're asking, what kind of pickle is that? This is a Kool-Aid pickle or a Kulickle. As it, you all know about Kulickles, right? Okay, oh, let me tell you about Kulickles. Here's how you make a Kool-Aid pickle. You get a jar of already made kosher dill pickles, take them out. If they're not already cut, then you cut them or poke holes in them. And then you make Kool-Aid with the pickle brine. And then you put the pickles back in there. Sir, are you okay? You're looking a little peaked. Are you okay? All right. Then you put the pickles back in there, close that jar, leave it there for two weeks. Then you take them out and eat them. If you like the taste of pickles and of Kool-Aid, it's just a sweet and sour combination. If you don't like either one of those things, this is one of the nastiest things you'll ever put in your mouth. So the reason why I think this is a great metaphor, because I think this is how people feel about the presidency. Depending on who's sitting in that Oval Office, they'll either love it or hate it. But the thing is, we want our presidents to be a lot like us. And food is a good window on the presidential soul. If we know a president has nostalgia for the foods of their childhood, they enjoy American foods and other things. We, we feel good about that president. And the savviest presidents have realized that, hey, they can use food to boost their popularity, which helps their political agenda, right? People don't want to cross a popular president. Remarkably, not every president has figured that out. So let's go quickly through the types of presidential cooking. 
This is the current White House chef, Christetta Comerford. She has actually been the White House executive chef since the second term of George W. Bush. So she is now one of the longest tenured executive chefs. The only other one was a guy named Henry Holler who worked from uh, the Carter administration, or sorry, the Johnson administration to Reagan. All right, so um, she was uh, an assistant chef under Clinton and then she became the White House executive chef. Quick sense of the hierarchy, you've got the White House executive chef and then there, are, there is a pastry chef who may have an assistant and then there's three or four usually assistants who help out with the cooking. So that's kind of the hierarchy. Um, and so the executive chef will usually do the uh, cooking for entertainment, uh, the state dinners, when there's meetings at the White House. It really just kind of depends on the direction of the president. Then you've got home cooking in the White House, because remember the White House is a business and a residence, right? A bus an office and a residence. And so you'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then um, depending on the president, they may hire their own private chef to do cooking just for the family. The last uh, president and first lady to do this were the Obamas. They had Sam Cass, who they knew back in Chicago. I think he is, his kids went to the same school or something as their kids, and so he became the White House um, private chef. But the last president to do that before the Obamas was Lyndon Johnson. So most presidents have the executive chef handle all the cooking. Uh, this is the dining room that was created on the second floor of the White House by Jacqueline Kennedy. The family used to have their meals in the state dining room, and she felt that wasn't intimate enough. So she turned Margaret Truman's bedroom into a dining space. <laughs> so there's the dining space, a kitchen, a small kitchen, and a little elevator to bring up food from the, the White House kitchen. And so this is the uh, original kind of um, Revolutionary War wallpaper that she had put up in the dining room, which... Um, Pat Nixon immediately had it taken down because she's like, who wants to eat with people dying all around you? So. <laughs> this is look at that same dining room during the Clinton administration. So the, the, there's decorating that happens with every administration to the taste of that first family. Then you have the elaborate state dinners. This is the most public face of White House cooking. So just a quick note, state dinners are only for the head of state uh, from a country. So if there's somebody else and the way the government's structured, then it would be an official dinner. So for instance, if the king or queen of England comes, it's a state dinner. But if the prime minister comes, it's an official dinner. Okay. Even though they form and function, they're pretty much the same thing. That, that's the difference here. And so um, the White House state dinners used to be just in the state dining room. And there used to be just one long table. And then, you know, a lot of people want to eat with the president on these occasions. So then the long table became a U-shaped table. And then the U-shape had a table in the middle just to get more people. Um, but at some point, you, there was only a certain amount of people, a number of people who could be in the state dining room. So the big innovation happened with the Kennedys in this form. They put in round tables. And once you put in round tables, they could get close to 200 people in there. And then there are some state dinners that spell out to the South Lawn. And if you do a state dinner on the South Lawn, then you can get 1,000 people. But it's really taxing on the, the staff to do that. But you can do that. And then there's a place called the White House Mess. This is not a political statement. This is a military term. If there are any military people in here, this is the dining space in the White House. So this is kind of an exclusive dining space. So this is for the senior staffers in the White House. So, you know, your, your close advisors to the president. And the way to think about this is like a private, almost like club within the White House. So you have to have a certain status in the White House in order to have mess privileges. And I got those towards the end of my stint in the Clinton White House. Um, I got elevated to special assistant to the president, and that gave me mess privileges. So I got to eat there a few times. And I, can, I don't know, this was 20 years ago, but I can tell you, they make a really good cheeseburger. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's also Camp David uh, in Maryland. And so uh, when the president goes to Camp David, the White House cooking team does not handle the cooking there. It's actually the US Navy. So Navy cooks are the ones who cook at Camp David depending on how much the president utilizes it. And they're also the cooks for the White House mess. Here's why. When the White House was renovated in the 1950s, they created the White House mess. It did not exist before that renovation. So uh, they needed more staff in the White House because for the first time ever, it became a year-round air-conditioned residence. So they needed more staff because they could do more things there. And they created the White House mess. Now, President Truman had a very contentious relationship with Congress. There was no way they were going to give him more funding for staff. And so Bess Truman decided to take the Navy cooks on the presidential yacht and reassign them to the White House mess. So that's how the Navy gets uh, in ingrained here 
and uh, White House cooking. And most of those cooks were Filipinos. So aside from African Americans, Filipinos have had the largest uh, kind of ethnic presence in White House presidential history. And then there's Air Force One. Now, to say there's cooking on Air Force One is a little bit of a stretch because you can't really do frying and other things uh, in an airplane. So usually what they're doing is they're reheating. And so uh, there's, the food is uh, cooked and assembled at Air, Andrews Air Force Base, and then they put it on the plane, and then they reheat it and do other things. So there are usually three uh, people who are in, on the plane uh, in, or, in terms of staffing the plane for service. One is in charge of reheating the food, another one is in charge of taking orders, and another one is in charge of just making drinks. Okay, so that's the rotation there. And then we've had the White House Garden. The, the White House Garden actually was first planted um, during John Adams' presidency, and it was where the Treasury Building is. Uh, so there's been a White House Garden for a long time, but it, you know, for a long time, for whatever reason, uh, presidents and first families just didn't use, use it anymore, so it was developed for other things. And there have been small kind of rooftop gardens to grow herbs and things for the White House kitchen. So when Michelle Obama carved out that space in the South Lawn to create a White House Garden, it really invigorated it. Now, my understanding from just talking to people is that uh, the White House Garden still exists, but it's not utilized to the same extent as the Obamas. And then the last thing I'll tell you about is Michelle Obama in 2014 started something she called the Kids State Dinner. And so as part of her healthy initiative, uh, eating initiative, she had a contest and she invited kids from all across the country uh, to just come up with healthy recipes and submit them. And so every state had a representative. And then in August uh, from 2014 to the end of the presidency, uh, Obama presidency, they would come to the White House and a few uh, recipes would be highlighted and they would cook for everybody and then they would talk about their dreams and hopes for healthy eating in our food system. So that just gives you a, a sense of the food. All right, this is the earliest picture we have of the White House domestic staff. Uh, this picture was taken on the spring of 1877. Does anybody know who was president spring of 1877? Oh, your history teachers would be so disappointed. All right, Rutherford B. Hayes. I know that was on the tip of your tongue, right? It's okay. All right, so if you look at this picture in the first row on the lower uh, left-hand side, or looking at it the lower right, that is the presidential cook for uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. Her name was Winnie Monroe. And her path to the White House kitchen was the path for most people. She just happened to be the cook for Rutherford B. Hayes in private life. He becomes president, and the president would often bring the cook that they were familiar with to the White House. And so she brought a taste of the familiar. You know, being a president is a very stressful job. So that's how she became the White House cook. As you can see, this is an all-black staff. And for most of White House history, uh, in the, at least in the 19th century, the staff was all-black until we get to the turn of the 20th century, and then you start to see it change. Here's a look at the White House kitchen staff at the dawn of the Kennedy presidency. And this is more representative of uh, the White House staff, kitchen staff over time. So it's been very multiracial and multi-class uh, in terms of its composition. So moving from left to right, you've got um, uh, this young African-American man was on the staff and unfortunately, uh, Chef Jackson, and unfortunately had a tragic car accident a little bit after this picture was taken that severed his legs. So he does make it back to the White House kitchen after uh, recovering, and he became the typist for the menus. So he does reconnect. Uh, and then I don't know who the gentleman is next to him, but in the middle there is Rene Verdon. He was the executive chef under um, the Kennedys, uh, a French guy, and was highly uh, touted and brought into the kitchen. But I want to point out the woman that's next to him, Esserline Dewberry. African-American woman who started working in the White House in the Truman administration and stays there until the Kennedy administration. Um, she was a very good cook, and I had a chance to talk to the, a longtime pastry chef, uh, Roland Mesnier, who just recently died. He died within the last year. Um, he said that she was a trained opera singer, and she would sing opera while they were making meals in the White House. So he called her Madame du Barry. Um, and so just really interesting story. And then um, the other two gentlemen are unnamed, but I want to point out the Filipino on the end there, again, showing the presence of Filipino um, chefs in the White House. Um, before the Kennedys come into office, there was actually a, a Filipino guy who was the head chef, um, and um, Pedro Udo is his name, and I've been in touch with his family. They just reached out to me, and so I'm hoping that we can tell the story of these Filipino cooks. All right, let's talk about the Southern chefs. So um, George Washington, uh, before the White House was built, the nation's capital was in Philadelphia. 
the house was demolished. Um, and so this is a look at what the house looked like at the time of his presidency. It was on Cherry Street in Philadelphia. Here's a look at the inside. Sorry, I couldn't get a, 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 an aspect ratio that really worked. But what I wanted to show you here is that Washington brought his enslaved uh, staff to Philadelphia with him. So if you look at the top here going back, you see there's a servant's hall. You can see the kitchen there. And um, that's where the enslaved would live and do their daily work. So um, one of the things that was problematic for Washington in bringing his enslaved staff there is that Philadelphia at that time had something called the Gradual Abolition Act of 1780. This was state law in Pennsylvania, which said if you were an enslaved person on Pennsylvania soil for six months or longer, you were automatically free. So does anybody know how, uh, how Washington got around this? Yeah. So right about the time the six-month deadline was going to toll, he had all of his enslaved people go out of state and stay a few weeks and then bring them back to start the clock over. So he does this throughout his presidency. So the first person I want to tell you about is Hercules. So I have to admit something that's quite embarrassing. This is not Hercules. So um, some art historians a couple of years ago determined, uh, for, let me just back up. For a long time, we thought that this was a portrait of Hercules because the name of this portrait is a George Washington, a, the General Washington's cook. And many people thought it was painted by Gilbert Stuart, who did the iconic you know, hand in the midriff uh, painting. So uh, when I found out about this painting, which is sitting in a museum in Spain, I thought, this is a great find. I can't wait to put them in my book and on the cover. And then these art historians figured out that it wasn't him. So they don't know who this is, but by the dress, they figure this is a chef from Haiti in the 1820s, just by the clothing. Um, and so we just don't know who this brother is. So now I wish they had figured this out before I put him on my cover, but you know, <laughs> you just gotta go with what you know at the time, right? So, but I still like to show this picture because I want us to imagine maybe what Hercules was like. So Hercules was enslaved as a teenager, purchased by the Washingtons from a guy named James Posey. And um, he was a boatman, but for whatever reason, they transferred him to the kitchen. So when Washington becomes president and he's in, New, uh, in Philadelphia, he hired a woman named Mrs. Reed, a white woman, to be his cook. And evidently, her food was nasty because she got fired within six months. And he brings up Hercules from Virginia uh, to be his cook. And immediately he makes a splash. Uh, he is written about in people's diaries and journals, people that came to eat with the Washingtons. And this brother's cooking was so impressive that after meals he was allowed to sell leftovers out of the presidential kitchen. He made a couple thousand dollars a year in the 1790s selling leftovers. All right, that's how impressive his cooking was. Um, and, and Washington allowed him some privileges. He would let him go out and walk and um, go walk about town after his shift. So he would get dressed up in a blue suit and have a gold cane and walk about. Um, he was allowed to go to the opera and to the circus. So you know, a lot of privileges. But Hercules wanted to be free. And so towards the end of Washington's presidency, um, Washington catches his son, Richmond, who was the assistant cook in Philadelphia with a satchel full of money. So Washington immediately suspects this is, an, a, this is, an, a, this is gonna fund an escape attempt. So uh, he decides, he confronts Hercules. Hercules says, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been faithful to you. I am loyal, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but Washington doesn't believe him. So instead of sending him back to Mount Vernon and to this kitchen that he knew well when he uh, apprenticed under a woman named Old Doll, an enslaved woman named Old Doll, he sends him to the fields to do hard labor. So this renowned chef is now in the fields doing hard labor. So on Washington's 65th birthday, which is actually today, the anniversary of it is today, um, while they were doing all kinds of uh, you know, activities to set up for the party and everything, he escapes. And it's believed that he made his way to Philadelphia. And this puts Washington in a panic. Washington had a volcanic temper. And he didn't like the idea of, of Hercules running away. So he spares no expense to get Hercules back, but he's un unsuccessful. Um, but this pained the Washingtons, and so I'm going to read a letter that Martha Washington sent. Oops, sorry about that. All right, I'm going to read a letter that Martha Washington sent to a friend of hers, and this sounds like something right out of the old housewives of um, the Real Housewives of Old Virginia. All right, she says she complains. I am obliged to be my own housekeeper, which takes up the greatest part of my time. Our cook Hercules went away so that I am much at a loss for a cook as for a housekeeper. 
Altogether, I am sadly plagued. <laughs> Not until after Washington dies do they see Hercules again, and he's walking the streets of Manhattan. So he made his way to Manhattan, and what we now know is that he took the name of the guy that owned him before Washington, James Posey, so he called himself Hercules Posey, and he was a chef in, in New York City, and then he dies in the year 1812. Thanks to the dogged research of some people, they believe they have located his grave in Lower East Side of Manhattan. If you're familiar with New York City, this is where Sarah Roosevelt Park is, and so they're trying to create a historical marker to mark um, where he was. But um, I think he's just in a very interesting story. Um, next is, and I'm cheating a little bit because he was never actually a presidential uh, cook, but this is James Hemings, one of the older brothers of Sally Hemings. And this is a list of the kitchen utensils at Monticello written in his own handwriting. So as a young man, when Jefferson becomes minister to France, he brings a young uh, James Hemings with him and spends an enormous, uh, exorbitant amount of money to have him trained as a classical French chef for three years. And then afterwards, he becomes the chef in residence at Jefferson's place right off the Champs-Elysees. So this is right on the eve of the French Revolution. So if you look at, uh, looking at this picture, if you look on your um, left-hand side, that smaller building, that's where Jefferson had his apartment. And so um, Hercules was the resident chef there at the Hotel de Langeau. This is where he learned how to play, uh, learned how to cook. He went to this uh, chateau right out of, outside of Paris, and essentially he trained there for three years, learning to become this uh, well-known uh, French cook. Um, they come back because the revolution is breaking out in France. They come back and they're in Philadelphia. And they're in Philadelphia around the same time as Hercules in Washington. So I, I believe that the two met. And here's an interesting thing that happens while they're in Philadelphia. Hemings comes to Jefferson and says, I want to be free. And Jefferson agrees on two conditions. He has to teach the other enslaved people at Monticello how to cook because Jefferson doesn't want to spend this money again training somebody. And he has to leave behind his recipes. And he does that. So he, uh, he's free, believed he, it's believed he goes to Baltimore, and then after being in Baltimore, he's in contact uh, with Jefferson. He comes back to Monticello for eight months, and then he leaves again. So um, I believe that he would have been the White House chef for Jefferson, except a few months before Jefferson is inaugurated, he drinks himself to death. So at 36 years of age, he's dead. Yeah, yeah, it's a really sad story. All right, and this is the kitchen where he worked. Um, but there was also another enslaved presence in the White House, and there were two women that worked for Jefferson. Oh, let me, before I get to that, let me talk about the mac and cheese. So there's this story going around that James Hemings invented mac and cheese. It's a lovely story, but it's not true. Mac and cheese has been around for thousands of years. Well, what does happen is James Hemings gets introduced to a mac, mac and cheese recipe. Jefferson loved mac and cheese. He had a mac and cheese Jones, for sure, because he had other uh, servants of him steal a macaroni maker and smuggle it back into the United States when Italians had macaroni making on lockdown. Okay, So he loved macaroni and cheese. So um, we know that macaroni and cheese was served in the White House because on February 6, 1882, a guy named Reverend Manasseh Cutler, who represented, who was in Congress and represented Massachusetts, wrote about him in his diary. And he said, was served uh, macaroni with onions and strillions, um, which was kind of the saucy thing. And he said it was, um, had a strong taste and was disagreeable. So he wasn't a big fan of the macaroni and cheese. But Cutler asked the guy sitting next to him to explain this dish, because he just, he couldn't comprehend it. He didn't know what was going on with all the noodles and everything. And the guy who explained the dish sitting next to him was, are you ready for this? Are you sure? OK. Meriwether Lewis from the Lewis and Clark expedition, who was a frequent guest at um, Jefferson's uh, household, uh, the White House. And on the, other, on the left side of your screen here, this is actually a description of the macaroni maker that was smuggled. And in Jefferson's own handwriting, he's explaining how to use this. So very inquisitive mind. But in the White House basement, during Jefferson's presidency, we had two enslaved women, Edith, uh, Edith uh, Fawcett and Frances Gillette Hearn, who actually cooked for uh, Jefferson throughout. They are the sous chefs to um, Honoraire, Honoraire Julien, who is the French chef in charge. And these women cook for him not only through his presidency, but also until he dies in retirement. And they never get freed on Jefferson's death. But we know that they spent all of their time in the White House. And um, sorry for the upside down thing, but I just wanted it lines up with other pictures. So if you're looking at this picture, the upside down 10, 
That's where the White House kitchen was initially. So people that were coming to the White House in the first years that it was open, and when they're coming in for dinners and other things, they would go up the portico and they would just peep in the kitchen because they could see everything that was happening there. But eventually the kitchen gets moved to where four and five are, and that's where it is to this day. And Mary Todd Lincoln is the one who moves it to that corner of the White House because she just wanted more. Uh, it, it was, she thought it was airier there and more natural light. All right, and so um, just to talk about the macaroni and cheese a little bit more, um, Believe it or not, in the, 18, in the 19th century, people would congratulate the president by sending a ton of cheese. So dairy makers across the country would do this. And so during Andrew Jackson's presidency, there actually was a ton of cheese that was sent. And um, during Jefferson's time, when he got a ton of cheese, he just put it in the East Room, and it was after dinner entertainment. People would eat in the White House and then go look at the big block of cheese in the East Room. <laughs> For Andrew Jackson, he decided, I'm never going to get rid of this cheese, so I'm just going to open the doors of the White House. We're going to give out free cheese with orange punch, and hordes descended on the White House. They, they, they said that there was cheese in the drapes and everything, like it took months to clean it. But, you know, different approaches. Here's what the White House kitchen on the ground floor looks. So you can see the move to the corner where it is now, the kitchen and what they call the scullery, where they would do a lot of the prep work for uh, the, the White House dishes. All right. So um, let's talk about Lincoln. Lincoln had uh, Southern cooks in the old soldier's home. And this is in Washington, DC. So this is kind of in Northwest Washington, DC. It was uh, built in the 1850s as a place for uh, war veterans to convalesce and also just to provide them shelter if they were um, experiencing homelessness. And so one woman who cooked for him was a woman named Mary Dines. And the way that Mary Dines comes into picture is she was enslaved in Maryland and she made her way, she escaped to a contraband camp at the, break of the, at the outbreak of the Civil War. And um, Lincoln, on his way from the old soldier's home, he would come up here during the summers and everything to actually cool off because it's at a higher elevation, so it was believed to be just a cooler place than being in the White House. Because remember, the White House is in a swamp. And so from the journey from the old soldier's home to the White House, he would pass this contraband camp, and he would hear Mary Dines singing spirituals, much like Becky at the copier. And so um, he actually, they started striking up a conversation. And so as he would go back and forth, he would actually request for Mary Dines to sing for him. I don't know how, she fig how he figured out that she could cook, but soon afterwards, she was installed as the cook here. Um, and she didn't like it here. She didn't like cooking here. So she demanded to be moved to the White House, and she got her way. So within months, she was cooking in the White House. Um, as far as food goes for Lincoln, we just don't know much. He was, uh, has a reputation for not eating a lot. They, many people said he ate like a bird. Um, but we know that one thing that Mary Dines made that he loved was cabbage and potatoes. So, homespun guy. Uh, next, next person I want to tell you about is Lori, Laura Dolly Johnson. Now, she was not enslaved. She was a free cook. Um, and the way that she comes to the White House is thanks to Theodore Roosevelt. So, Theodore Roosevelt is traveling the country, and he goes to Lexington, Kentucky, and he eats at the home of a guy named Colonel May, John Mason Brown. And at this home, he has Laura Dolly Johnson's food, and he just loves it. And so he wires uh, back to the White House in D.C. and tells the incoming uh, Benjamin Harrison that he should hire her as, a, as his cook. So um, Dolly Johnson gets offered this, and she was very reluctant at first. She did not want to leave her life in Kentucky, but eventually they talk her into going to um, the White House. There was only one problem. Oh, I'm sorry. This is one of the earliest pictures that we have of the White House basement kitchen. So that's Dolly Johnson in the middle there. And immediately on the right is the coal furnace stove that was installed during the Fillmore administration. And the story behind this is that before, the White House was hearth cooking, giant fireplace with hooks, and they would elevate the pots and pans, things like that. So they installed this coal, coal furnace, and the black cook at the time, who was unnamed, refused to cook on it. He called it the devil's contrapment. So the story is, is that Miller Fillmore went to the patent office got the design and instructions on how to use this stove, and then walked the cook through it, and then the cook was sold. So this has been around since the Fillmore administration. So this is Dolly Johnson. Uh, she eventually gets talked into going to cook at the White House. There was one problem. There was already a French woman named Madame Pellunard, who was previously cooking at the British Embassy, and she's already in the White House kitchen. So when Dolly Johnson gets hired, there are newspaper articles all across the country announcing her hire. So this did not sit well with Madame Pellinard, Pellinard, right? This was much like what happened on The Bachelor a few years ago, when that guy Ari was in love with, you know, he proposed to one woman but really liked somebody else. 
So what we find out is that Madame Pelunard sues the, the president. So this is the first lawsuit by a White House employee against the president. It gets resolved and Dolly Johnson comes in to work there, but she's only there for about eight months because her daughter back in Lexington gets ill. And so she moves back to Lexington to care for her daughter. But her cooking was so renowned that when Grover Cleveland beats Benjamin Harrison and comes to the White House, he talks her, Dolly Johnson, into coming back. So she comes back to cook for Grover Cleveland. One of the things that's really impressive about Dolly Johnson is after her White House day, she goes back to Lexington and she opens up a restaurant playing, trading off her White House frame, fame, right? So dig that. A woman, black woman, 1890s Kentucky, has the guts to do this. I think it's really impressive. On the recipe cards, you'll see uh, the recipe for deviled almonds. I'm not here to promote addiction, but I'm just gonna say that it's hard just to have only one of those. <laughs> and then we talk, then I'll fast forward to the 20th century, I wanna talk about Daisy Bonner. Daisy is a cook for um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he would go to Warm Springs, Georgia. He would go there periodically to get treatments for his polio, and a wealthy white family loaned Daisy Bonner, who was their cook, to the president in order to ingratiate themselves with the president. So she would, um, he would stay there weeks at a time. And the reason why is because the food he was getting at the White House was nasty. I mean, he said it was, I don't know if you all know about the automat, but he compared the food at the White House to the automat. Uh, so he welcomed any chance to get great food. So Daisy Bonner introduced him to southern delicacies like Country Captain, it's a, co a coconut or a, a chicken curry dish out of Georgia. Um, you know, all kinds of southern specialties, and we'll talk about one in particular. So on the other side, you've got a souffle, and I, I tell this story because Daisy Bonner cooked the last intended meal for FDR. So uh, my cooks in the audience, what is the biggest fear about having a, a cooking a souffle? That it falls. So I'm about to tell you a miracle. She says on the day that FDR died, he was sitting for a portrait, you may have seen the unfinished portrait, and she had a cheese souffle timed to be served at 1.15. He had his fatal cerebral hemorrhage at 1.12. So he never got that souffle. Daisy Bonner says that this souffle did not fall for two hours until he was officially pronounced dead. And then it fell. Fantastic story, but that, uh, I don't know if it's true or not. But anyway, I think it's a great story. So um, there's uh, just another quick uh, aside about souffles. Um, another president loved souffles, but he was habitually late, and that president was John F. Kennedy. So Rene Verdon was really miffed about this. So does anybody have an idea what Rene Verdon's strategy was to get President Kennedy a souffle that had not fallen? Bring him and, Marilyn What's that? Bring him <laughs> That is good. I like that. No, not bring in Marilyn Monroe. Any ideas? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yes. So what he would do is he would make four separate souffles and then he would cook them at 15 minute intervals, hoping that Kennedy would show up on time for just one of them. So uh, when um, Roosevelt dies, Daisy Bonner's distraught. She's the one who actually notifies the White House switch switchboard of what happened. And then if you go to Warm Springs, Georgia today, they preserve the kitchen and the site and they have on her wall, on the wall, her handwriting, cook the first and last meal for President Roosevelt. So she was deeply um, touched by that and, and saddened and, and really relished the opportunity to cook for Roosevelt. And one thing she got him hooked on were pig's feet. So on the left side, these are pig's feet from Florida Avenue Grill in Washington, D.C., the oldest operating uh, soul food joint in the, in the country and the world, actually. And the way that Roosevelt liked uh, pig's feet was he got a recipe from Mar Princess Margaret from Norway for sweet and sour pig's feet. But the way that Daisy Bonner make, made them was more Southern. She would uh, take them, broil them, split them, and then butter them. And he loved that. And so he will actually serve these to Winston Churchill in the White House. And we know this because uh, some of the servants witnessed the whole uh, episode. So uh, Winston Churchill takes a bite of these pig's feet and doesn't say anything. And FDR asked him, well, how do you like them? And he said, well, they have an interesting texture, kind of chewy. And then FDR said, oh, okay, well, next time we'll have them fried. And he said, I don't think I would like them fried. <laughs> and then I do, uh, there's a whole drinking culture in the White House. And so this is Alonzo Fields. Alonzo Fields uh, begins working in the White House um, for President Hoover, and he stays through Eisenhower. But the White House butlers were the ones responsible for making drinks. And so um, 
even during Prohibition, there was a lot of drinking going on. It just wasn't very public. But I want to show you the, this, share with you this passage from his memoirs, just talking about how they got the alcohol. So uh, it depends on the president, but a lot of presidents would get alcoholic gifts. Okay, they would get bottles of wine, all, hardcore alcohol, all of these things. And so often they were just repurposing the things that they got. And there are other presidents that would just use the liquor that was seized by the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms grow. <laughs> So he says this, he says, uh, President Roosevelt wasn't much about, uh, ordered me to use up all the gift wines for spike punch. There was sherry, sweet, dry, and just sherry, Sautern, Claret, Muscatel, Scuppernog, Blackberry, Concord, Applejack, white wines, and Japanese sake. And he said that he, um, he, he was really scared about somebody getting drunk and maybe doing something, and he ends this um, this passage of memoirs by saying he was scared that there would be a headline saying Chief Butler being held for investigation. <laughs> but he also uh, would make the favorite drinks of these presidents. And so the Trumans love to have an old-fashioned cocktail. Is there anybody who's an old-fashioned cocktail enthusiast who can tell me what's in an old-fashioned? Bourbon. Okay, yeah. Very good. Do you all have one just before you came over here? Okay. So, so they had all of these ingredients, right? So the first night that the Trumans are in the White House, they request an old-fashioned cocktail before having dinner. So Fields makes an old-fashioned the way that he had done for several presidents. Um, best Truman takes one sip and doesn't say anything. So Fields knows this is a bad sign. So sure enough, the next morning, he's serving breakfast, and Best Truman says to him, Fields, could you not make our old fashions so sweet? We're just not used to having them that way. He said, that's fine. So the next time they ask for an old fashioned, he makes it in a different recipe, serves it. Best Truman says, these are horrible. They taste like fruit punch. So now Fields has an attitude, right? So the next time they ask for an old fashioned, he just gives her straight bourbon and a couple cubes of ice. Best Truman takes one sip, looks at Fields and says, now that's how you make an old fashioned. <laughs> Another interesting story is Henry Pinckney. So Henry Pinckney um, was a, from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I have a beautiful picture of Henry Pinckney, but his heirs reached out to me after this book came out and shared that picture, and they made me promise that I would never do it publicly until their book comes out. So I'm showing you the wagon that he used to go to Central Market in DC to do the shopping every day. So that's as close as we're gonna get, but I do have a great picture of him. But he uh, got President Theodore Roosevelt in involved in a controversy um, involving mint juleps, ju mint juleps. So somebody tell me what's in a mint julep. Bourbon? Bourbon. And mint, right? All right. So what happened is uh, post-presidency, there was a newspaper uh, uh, editorialist who was not pro-Roosevelt. And he heard that Roosevelt was going to probably challenge Taft. And so he put out that Roosevelt was a drunk. Now, in that time, you know, in the early 1900s, that was fighting words. And so President Roosevelt actually sued the newspaper editor for libel. And at the trial, President Roosevelt went through every single drink that he had had. Now he got to the mint julep and he said, and this is gonna sound like another president, he said, I didn't drink it, I just took a sip. Okay? We don't have, that's the story for another day. We're not talking about that other president. So the, New York, uh, so the St. Louis Globe Democrat went into high gear in terms of ridiculing him because this mint julep was made by the man on the other side of the screen, an African-American bartender named Tom Bullock, who actually has a, a book out of drinks. Um, it's a wonderful book that was uh, print, printed right around the time of Prohibition. And so the St. Louis Globe Democrat said, there is no way that any human being could have had one sip of Tom Bullock's mint juleps. <laughs> so they ridiculed him enough for other things. So it turns out that President Roosevelt won that trial, and as damages, he got six cents. But for him, it was just the, the, you know, the victory of, of going through that whole thing. Another one, um, this is John Money from Easton, Maryland. And he was a great friend to Dwight Eisenhower, who I would say is probably the most cookingest president we've ever had. I just made that word up. And uh, he loved to cook. In fact, one of the things that he loved was to grill steaks. And so this is Money and uh, Roosevelt grilling steaks. And I show this picture because it reminds me of one of my favorite White House stories. Um, Roosevelt actually had a grill installed on the rooftop of the White House. So in the 1950s, people were walking up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, and they would see smoke coming out of the White House, right? And it was the president up there grilling. 
So he and Moni uh, met in World War II. Uh, Moni was actually Roosevelt, or sorry, Eisenhower's valet. So that's how they built that relationship. And they became friends. And actually, when um, Eisenhower dies, he wills Moni some money and some other things. So that just shows you what, how they um, interacted. But in the White House, um, Moni was known for making this very vegetable-laden beef stew. And um, even though Eisenhower's, it was Eisenhower's recipe, within the White House, it was known as Moni stew. The trick was is that Mamie Eisenhower did not like the smell of onions. So there was a lot of subterfuge in terms of cooking this and not getting her to smell the onions. So there was a lot of sneaking around to cook this. But an interesting thing about this is in 1956, the uh, Republican Party actually encouraged people to reach out to their neighbors and have Eisenhower stew suppers. So they released the recipe for this stew and then encouraged people to go over to the neighbors and have an, uh, make this beef vegetable stew and then talk about Eisenhower. I think that's genius and somebody should bring that back. So in the 1960s, really during the Kennedy administration is when we see the height of power for Southern chefs in the White House and these African-American chefs and then also their demise. And mainly it's because of this. Jacqueline Kennedy forever changed the trajectory of cooking in the White House by emphasizing European French food. And these African-American chefs did not have that expertise. So as they either left the White House or retired, there was a phasing out and then we have European chefs, European or classically trained chefs coming in their stead. So that, this is the high watermark for this. I'm not saying it's racist, I'm just saying it's a change in taste. Um, and then we wouldn't really see another change until the Clinton administration when Hillary Clinton emphasized American food. So this is the last time that we see these Southern chefs at, at play and, 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 the, and doing their thing. So one of my favorite figures in the whole book is a woman named Zephyr Wright. It's from Marshall, Texas. Grew up not too far from Lady Bird Johnson. And so when um, Lyndon Johnson wins his congressional race, uh, you know, the family is, uh, he's a, his ambition and everything, the family wants to get a cook to help them also, in, not only in Texas, but in Washington, D.C. They hire Zephyr Wright, who was learning to be a dietitian, and her cooking was legendary. And a lot of people ascribe, uh, ascribe Johnson's rise in Congress to her cooking. And I'm going to tell you something that's going to sound like science fiction. Okay, once upon a time, members of Congress would go to each other's homes and like get to know each other and socialize, you know? And so no, very few people passed up a chance to have Zephyr Wright's popovers, her peach cobbler, her fried chicken, all these kind of things. Um, Fast forward to when Johnson becomes president, she is instrumental in actually the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So the family would drive from Central Texas to Washington, D.C., go through the segregated South. Zephyr Wright, just re at a point, because of the indignities she suffered, she just refused to make the trip because she wasn't allowed to eat with the family. She wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom with the family. So she said, you know what? I'm just going to stay in D.C. year-round. So when Johnson is lobbying for the 1964 Civil Rights Act, he actually uses those Jim Crow experiences to marshal support for the legislation. And when he signs the bill, you know, when presidents sign bills, they have like 70, bill, 70 pens or whatever. He gives her one of the pens and says, you deserve this as much as anyone. But she did get the president in a little bit of trouble. And it's something I call the Great Chili Controversy of 1964. Now, do I have any Texans in the audience? Okay, my Texan friends, tell people what true chili is. So, say it loud. Beef and spices. spices. She didn't say beans, right? No beans. And so in 1964, the White House releases a recipe for Pertinalis River chili. The recipe's in the book. And the nation was scandalized because it was a beanless chili. So the White House had to go into spin control and just reassure people that their president liked beans. <laughs> so one of my biggest finds is I found an audio clip between Juanita Roberts, who was Johnson's social secretary, and Zephyr Wright talking about the bean preferences of President Johnson. So I'm gonna play this clip for you right now. Just a little context. Uh, there was a recording system under Roosevelt, but really Kennedy is the first one to have a White House recording system. Of course, Johnson used it extensively, and he's the one that recommended it to Nixon, and we all know how that turned out. <laughs> all right, the first, vo verse, uh, first, first voice you're going to hear is Juanita Roberts, and then you'll hear Zephyr Wright. We have correspondents asking us if the president and the family uh, like beans. <laughs> well, I know enough to say yes, <laughs> uh, but I wanted to check with you. What, uh, what would you say if you were asked that 
questions by a responsible person? Oh, I would say yes. And uh, did I ask what kind did it? No, but I know that uh, he particularly liked uh, pork and beans. He liked pork and beans, he liked pinto beans, he liked uh, lima beans, green beans, and that's green lima. Uh, I drive, that's green lima. Green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the green, uh, uh, fresh green beans. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And he likes the blue lake can green beans, you know, marinated and he uses it itself. Uh huh. Marinated and, and fish good. Uh huh. So, yeah. and he likes, well, that's not a bean unless it's here, so the green beans. But he just likes beans. Now, the green llamas, uh, you the baby llamas. Green baby lime. Uh, how do you prepare those for me? Does uh, in salty water and cook them and, and add a little uh, oil and margarine uh -huh. and pepper uh -huh. and cook them for a good long while until the juice in them is kind of thick. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, you used to get it for the Alpha, but you don't do that anymore. Well, I do that. <laughs> I probably use uh, the Alpha. Also, uh, mushrooms. You know, you call it uh, lima beans with cheese and mushroom sauce. Uh huh. Uh, and the pinto, I guess you cook like I do, which uh -huh. I call a right. pinto. That's right. Yeah. And uh, pork and beans. Do you dust them up? Not for him. He likes them just plain. He dusts them himself with some kind of uh, pepper sauce or something like that. Uh huh. All right. Zephyr, do you know where any of the chili cards are, chili recipe cards? Mm-hmm. I sure don't. I may have one or two here. Well, somebody's got some, and I'll find them because I need that one also. Okay. Nice job, you Thank you a lot. Bye. All right, I want to, I want to know how many of y'all use Velveeta for special occasions? How many? All right. <laughs> Believe it or not, Lady Bird Johnson said that those chili recipe cards were the second most requested document from the federal government in 1964. <laughs> the only thing people wanted to know more about was the newly installed um, Women and Children Nutrition Program. So that just shows you the power of these recipes. So this is one of my favorite finds in the book. All right, and then um, Air Force One. Now, she's not from the South, but she's from Bermuda, so I think that's close enough. But she, uh, she was the first African-American attendant on Air Force One. And so she was actually on the plane on 9-11. And so she shares her experiences. But basically growing up, she went on an Eastern Airlines flight. For I don't know how many people remember Eastern Airlines. Uh, and the flight attendant was so nice to her that when she went in the military, she said, I'm going to fly one of these days. And so she started a path that led to her being on Air Force One. And so it was w wonderful to get to know her and to find out her experience being on Air Force One on 9-11. But um, she is now in Georgia, and she's looking to write a book about her experiences, and including a, 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 child, a, a children's book. But uh, one of the favorite things that she served on uh, Air Force One, and this recipe's in the book, was a Hawaiian French toast. So she would take Hawaiian bread and make French toast out of that, and it's quite delicious, actually. And then I'll end with uh, Walter Jetton uh, in barbecue diplomacy. So he was from Texas. I'm, I'm counting Texas as part of the South. I know some of you might argue with me about that. But uh, Johnson, again, he was just so um, enthusiastic about barbecue that in 1964, he actually had a barbecue state dinner with the president of Mexico. And so at his Hill Country Ranch, they had all kinds like sausage, venison, uh, ribs, and everything. And Walter Jetson, um, was his chief barbecuer. And so he was known from throughout Texas, had uh, African-American staffers that worked with him, but this was the barbecue guy. And so uh, through Johnson, a lot of people got a taste of Southern barbecue. In fact, when he was running for election the first time in uh, 64, um, he, actually had, <laughs> he actually had his daughters and other people doing barbecues all over the country in order to garner support for him. Again, a brilliant idea, and I don't know why anybody doesn't do that now. All right, so I'm going to end there. I'm going to leave this up so you can connect with me on social media, but I look forward to your questions, so thank you so much. All right, so I have a request. 
When folks from the audience come up to ask their question, if Adrian, you could repeat the question so our Zoom attendees can hear the question and the answer. Okay. And then I invite folks to come up and ask a question. I'm going to toggle back and forth between our Zoom questions and our in-person questions. And it looks like we have one. Oh, yes. great. Come on up. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, uh, serendipity, the time the article came out in the local paper uh, about you, there was also a history program about a book written about the, about the, uh, the president's food. Uh, and in that history program, it talked about that the president family had to pay for their own food. Mm -hmm. So when they went to, if they're on the Air Force One, or if they're at uh, Camp David, do they have to pay for the food up there? And do they have to pay for the chef? So the question is, do, people have, do, do first families have to pay for their food and pay for the chefs? So that has changed. Before Truman, presidents had to pay for their food and chef out of their own pocket. And so, you know, most of our presidents have been wealthy people, so it wasn't that big a deal. But when you had somebody like Abraham Lincoln, you know, that was problematic. So often what Abraham Lincoln did is that he would go to the army commissary <laughs> and get his food out of there. But for the most part, our presidents had to pay for food. Once Truman was president, Congress started allocating funding for the household, for the residents. Now, first families can decide how they want to spend that money. So this is what happens. Because uh, you would think, you know, you can just have whatever you want all the time as a president. But what happens is when you get food or meal, you're actually presented a bill that's charged against your account. And so that's how they keep track of the expenses. So everything you have is, you know, so we have a lot of instances of presidents yelling at the first lady saying, stop spending so much money. I mean, Jack, John F. Kennedy was all over Jackie Kennedy about that. So we, we have those examples. But basically, yeah, you're presented a bill and then you have to pay that. Now, in terms of the staff, that's allocated through Congress. And so there is a shell game happening. Um, so what happens is a lot of first families will pay for a chef, not out of their executive residence budget, but out of some uh, administrative agency budget. So the person may be tasked for an administrative agency, but they're working at the White House. And then there are quite a few military cooks now, U.S. Navy, that are working in the White House as well. So that's how it happens. But yeah, there's a, there's a running account that gets charged against. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Don't be shy. All right, well, I, I can proactively answer a question. So people often ask me, does the president have a taster? And yes, the president does have an official taster. It's usually the opposition leader in Congress. <laughs> just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, the taster is actually the chef. So the presidential chef is the last person that tastes the food before it gets sent to the president. So that's, that's who the taster is, yeah. Out of the 150 soul food restaurants that you uh, visited during your research, which was the best? Oh man, I love Bully's Soul Food in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, it's still open to this day. It's the kind of place, now they changed because of COVID, but before COVID, they had a dining table right off. Oh, sorry, somebody asked me, um, I didn't repeat the question. Uh, the question was, out of the 150 soul food restaurants that I visited across the country, which, which one was the best? Um, right off the main dining room, they have a table and somebody would periodically come out and strip greens and peel sweet potatoes. So it's that kind of place. And then they had Blackberry Cobbler, which this Denver guy does not get very often. So I definitely love that. So I actually was in uh, Bully Soul Food just a week ago. And uh, the food was delicious. And then it's just the conversations uh, that between the staff and the, what the customers were having. I just love being in the South for those conversations. In I'll give you one example. City. What's that? In what city? Uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bullies? Bullies? Uh, B-U-L-L-Y apostrophe S. Yeah. So this was an actual, I heard this while I was having lunch there a couple weeks ago. This guy's like, yeah, I'm a country boy. You know, that fresh roadkill, that's the best meat you can get. <laughs> Don't got no bullet in it. I was like, okay. All right, so we've got two questions from Zoom. Uh, the first one, Renee asks, how long did it take you to research and write the Kitchen Cabinet book? So that book took me four years. So it took me 12 years to get to the point where I could write soul food. And then it took me four years to do the president's kitchen cabinet and three to do uh, the barbecue book. And the, real, the main reason is because I spent so much time getting initial research. So a lot of it is just drawing off that initial research. So that's why these other books are, um, take less time for me to write. But look, if I could get a publishing um, deal 
where I could spend much more time writing these books, I would love that. So to me, my books feel a little bit rushed. Um, I wish I just had more time, but that's just not the reality I've had as a writer. So um, yeah, 12 years, four years, three years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Carla wants to know, was there a favorite dessert for more than one president? Uh, was there a favorite dessert for more than one president? No, you know, it was just really, that's the mixed bag um, when it came to desserts. It was all over the place. So it was really just what the president liked. Kind of, kind of the, the, the one of the few consistent things are um, mac and cheese, fried chicken, and cornbread in terms of stuff sold in, in the home cooking part uh, of the White House. So um, in terms of presidential desserts, it's just all over the place. I can't remember, maybe ice cream, but other than ice cream, I can't remember anything that was consistently served. And I've looked at a lot of presidential cookbooks and recipes. Thank you. Other folks from the audience? Yeah, come on up. Uh, in your research, uh, did you come across presidents or, or people who were, the cook had to cook for that had either food allergies or vegetarians or had some kind of, how did they deal with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the question is like, how do White House cooks deal with food allergies, taboos, that kind of thing? The only thing that I've heard about, and let me just step back, a lot of presidential eating and stuff is in a, a, a cone of silence because that's a very private part of, of presidential life. And so, you know, they're only going to let us hear about it if, if they want to. So the only thing that I can say that's close to that is um, they've had some kosher dinners in the White House. And so they actually had a rabbi come to the White House kitchen and kosherize it. Um, so that's the only thing I know. Otherwise, what they usually do is they will have outside caterers handle those food requests. So other than that one instance, um, most of the food was provided by somebody outside the White House. Uh, and then when they travel, depending on where they're going, sometimes the president brings their own culinary staff to cook their meals. They don't rely on the other cooks. Here's the interesting thing. In terms of security, the safest a president is is when they just show up to a restaurant unannounced because there's no advanced planning. And this is what happens. I'm just going gonna, gonna to answer, answer a question you didn't ask. Um, so when, when the president goes to someplace outside the White House, if there's advanced planning, you know, they work with the staff and they make sure that everything is um, on lockdown. But if they just show up, what they do is they seal the building, they get the social security numbers of everybody there and run it for security purposes. And then whoever is making the meal, there is actually a trained chef on the Secret Service team who stands there, he's, the person's armed, and they're watching you cook. Now, if you watch cooking elimination shows, right? <laughs> I don't think it's more intense than that, right? Uh, and then there's, uh, there are hilarious stories of the president um, asking for something and it not being available. And so um, there, there's typically like a, some requests, because what the, the White House staff, instead of, you know, they anticipate what the president wants and they want to have it available. But there are two dairy products that a president asked for and they weren't available. So the first one is Eisenhower in 1950. What is a dairy product that Eisenhower could ask for at the last minute and the White House was unlikely to have in 1950? Yogurt. yogurt. Right, so the, pres they, so the White House staff, the butlers had to get in a limousine and find yogurt at nine o'clock at night, which at that time was not the easiest thing, but they managed to pull it off. The second was Nixon. Any, can anybody imagine what Nixon cottage wanted? Cheese. Cottage cheese, yes. And actually, Nixon's last meal before he gets on the helicopter and flies out, and they have a picture of this, it's cottage cheese surrounded by pan, pineapple slices. That's his last meal as president. So, yeah. And ketchup. And ketchup, yeah. And interestingly, so Nixon liked it with ketchup, and then Ford liked cottage cheese with A1 sauce. Um, I was thinking about how you're like an archivist and an archaeologist and you've just done all this work that feels also like a lot of ancestry work and tracking and that must be a really big gift and also a lot to hold and I'm wondering what it's been like for you when you encounter people who you didn't know who have a really intimate connection to maybe people you've put up on the screen. Yeah, so uh, the question is, with my journey, just um, the way that I've interacted with people that I write about, like their descendants and heirs, that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, it's been really interesting because I've had people reach out to me, and I'm always nervous, right? Because I'm thinking they're going to say, man, you messed that story up for my ancestor. 
And that hasn't really happened that much. People have just been honored that their ancestor was mentioned. And then they start giving me stuff that I didn't know. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I knew you when I was writing this book. So they round out the details. And there's a lot of fun family stories that you're just never gonna see show up in a book. And so it's been a real honor. I mean, everybody, except for one person, everybody who's come to me has been really thrilled uh -huh. that I'm sharing this history. It's an amazing way to crowdsource more work too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll have to strain a little bit. Yeah, let's move it down a little okay, bit. Okay, thank you. There we go. Um, my parents were grocers. They owned a tiny, tiny neighborhood grocery store in Rochester, New York. I grew up in this store. That's where I learned to roller skate, bumping into customers. And my parents would go to the public market to pick out produce. My father pinched and sniffed and you know shook everything that before it went in the store. So I'm curious about how was the food source for the White House? Do they have a standing order with a local market or is it farm to table like Asheville or how does the food come in? So for most of this uh, food now, it's in a secure food chain. So people that provide food to the White House are not supposed to talk about it because oh, okay. that creates opportunity for somebody to do something. So yeah, they have to be completely secretive. Now Would that's changed over time. Question, oh, I'm sorry. What what is the how is food sourced for the White House? I don't know why I keep forgetting that. I think it's because they're speaking to a mic. But how is food sourced into the White House? So prior to the 20th century, uh, the White House usher, uh, they they called it the steward back then. But this is the person in charge of managing the White House, the White House as a household. They would actually go to the markets in D.C. and everybody knew who this person was. Now. The understanding was is that the vendors would not tout that they're doing this in the papers and things. So there was kind of an agreement, hey, we'll patronize you as long as you don't you know, flex it, as the kids would say today. Um, so that happens. And then uh, eventually, in the 20th century, they just started securing the food sourcing. So now there's a secure chain. But before, they would just shop with the local markets. And the only farm to table aspect would be for holidays. So there would be certain people in competition to raise the White House turkey for Thanksgiving. And there was a lot of competitions about this. And, and, and they let people kind of flaunt that because it was kind of a fun story. Um, so on holidays, people would do the, the White House turkey. Believe it or not, there were White House possum. And believe it or not, for a long time in our presidential history, people would just send food to the White House and drinks and stuff, and they would eat it. They would eat it. So, I, yeah, I think that's really dangerous now. So that's how they source. And then um, other than that, most recent example is the White House Garden. So during the Obamas, they were using the White House Garden extensively and providing um, some of that food was actually served at state dinners and during meals for guests that came to the White House. Yeah. And I think we've got time for one more question. Okay. Send us off. Throughout your experience of researching and eating and writing these books, have you experienced any personal transformation that you find really valuable? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. So well, during this journey of writing, have I experienced any transformation um, in, during the process? And I would say this, um, and I talked about this earlier today with some students and faculty here. So through food, I have found out a lot more about my ancestors' journey, especially the daily lived experience of slavery. I grew up knowing it was bad, right? But it was all surface level. I had no idea the true evil that slavery operated as day in and day out. And it played out through food. Slaveholders tried to control food. Um, sometimes when slaveholders were punishing the enslaved, they used barbecue sauce. So they would whip somebody till their back was bleeding and then they would pour vinegar and red pepper mixed up, which is barbecue sauce in the 18th, 19th century. And you know, so that sadism, I just didn't knew, didn't know. So that is something, it just deepened um, my appreciation for what my ancestors went through, their resiliency, their ingenuity, and you know, how they survived. So that was the biggest thing. Um, and then just seeing how they took all these food traditions and other things from different parts of the world, because they had their own food traditions, but then others were forced on them, but they were able to create beautiful things and delicious things um, through their uh, culinary knowledge. So those two things were the, the things that impacted me the most. And I'll just tell you this, a couple years ago, there was a, there was a time when it looked like I might be writing the memoir of somebody whose father was a serial killer. And I, actually, I was excited for that, because I thought, oh man, I can have disposable income now, you know, writing that book. Um, but, I know, I'm so bad. Um, 
But friends of mine were worried for me. They just said, look, that's really bad. Are you sure you want to go down that road? And I said, look, after reading the oral histories of enslaved people, there's nothing worse than that than what they went through. So, yeah, thanks for that. Well, thanks for being here. I just want to say that, um, oh, thank you. I just want to say there's books out for sale. I'm happy to sign it um, any way you want because I'm just so grateful that you have my books. So if you want me to write that I couldn't have written the book without you, I will do that. So thank you, Asheville, for coming out. I really appreciate you. <laughs>